about to get this independent thing get started the right way. You know what I mean? Got one of the forefathers joining me in a few. Oh, there he is. There he is. There he is. What up? El Chivo in this motherfucker. Man, feeling good on this Memorial Day, man. How oh, you feeling, bro? Ernie, man. How you holding up over there, man? Man, hi, man. Hi, Mellow, <laughs> man. Hi, Mellow. <laughs> so, you know, I, I've been tagging all my friends. Fucking come on. Look. What? I've been doing this thing on my live called Independent Thinking. Mm -hmm. with happening with all my friends creatives and you know just digging for insight for aspiring artists um and executives whoever um in this culture that we in and you know you're a multifaceted guy so a, a lot a lot of my conversations is really combing through the journey too because a lot of people can learn from the journey and gain insight just from what's going on you know what i mean and for sure you know, our origin, we we go fucking we we go back, fucking Jordan Tower days. I met you from yeah. Dice Bubs. Shout out to my Shout brother. Shout out to Bubsy, right? Yeah, he met you through the Jacker, right? And and you guys That's a piece of the Jack, piece to the Jack, and you guys did the first ever Smokeathon where everybody from all the, from all of the different states and Shice came back with cherry pie and all these fucking buds I'd never seen in my life. Yeah. It's that was like, really good old days. And the Jack, like, you got to meet them. And I'm like, hold on. And, you know, fast forward maybe like a few months, maybe to a year later, I think I met you in Dallas for a Smokers Club show. It might have been Houston or Dallas, one of the shows you had flew in for. But then, you know, we've been rocking that since. So for you, when did you get in to the weed game like when did you get um a lord with weed like man when i mean when i first started fucking with like the game in general probably like around like sixth grade seventh grade i was out in arizona at the time um all my homies older brothers were just selling big bills like the mexican mexican dirt you know what i mean and and i was just around that and fucking with that and selling ounces for hella cheap and just when I came back to visit where I was from, San Francisco Bay Area, because I went out there with my mom, when I came back to visit my dad, I realized California had so much different weed. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, I brought back some weed from Cali back to Arizona, and when I seen the look in everyone's face when I came through with that shit they ain't never seen before, I fell in love with that rush. You know what I mean? Like, just having some new shit. And that's why the whole time you've known me, we've always been busting out new, new, the cherries, the cookies, the tomatoes, the... You know what I mean? The whole the whole menu. So it was when I was young. When I got into it legally was when I was 18, uh, fucking around with the Hemp Center on Geary, the club out in Frisco. But I, I've been in love with weed since I first smoked it. Right, right. I think Let we both... Shit. Yeah, we... <laughs> <laughs> we both have common love for weed. You know what I mean? Like, um, you know, my first time coming to the Bay, it was like, you know, it was a different experience for me because I never really been in dispensaries like that. And you were my tour guide that like really introducing me to a lot of this shit I'd never seen before. Like, how did you get into the clubs? Cause I know, you know, I'm from the East Coast and that's not yeah. a culture that we're really familiar with because we don't have dispensaries over here. So everything was like black market. How did you find your way to work in the club. So when I was, uh, before, when I turned 18, the first thing I did on that, on my birthday on that day was went and got my medical marijuana card, right? And I was so obsessed with going to the store because when I was young, we used to have people running there and get edibles and clones and try to grow weed in the backyard and all this shit. So when I turned 18, I got my card. I started going to a spot and I fell in love with the spot. It was the hemp center before the one I worked at and I started shooting a documentary there. I'd come in every day and with my camera and I'd film and I'd do interviews and I think the owner of the spot was just kind of like, yo, this dude's passionate about this shit. And so one day I came in, she's like, you're going to start working here on Wednesday. Here's what I'm going to pay you. 
and you get health benefits. I'm like, damn, okay, shit. So I got hired just randomly. I didn't really try to apply. I was trying to make a documentary. That's some of the footage you've seen on the 11-11 documentary I put out when I was hella young in there. I was right. filming that shit, you know, as a fan of the clubs. And so when I started working there, that's when the whole game really opened up to me, you know, meeting cultivators and growers and breeders and people that make hash and edibles and learning that, you know, it's not federally legal still and having CHP come seize money from us when we were open and had no warrant or nothing like that. They just came, took all the bread and bounce. So, you know, at the end of the day, like, that's how I got into it. I, I got chose somehow into it. Uh, shout out to Kathleen Lemons, who owned the Hemp Center, but she hired me when I was young, and uh, I soaked up a lot of knowledge during that time. That's fire. How did you meet the Jack? How did you and the Jack get cool? Man, so I was walking down Hate Street uh, in San Francisco, where Burners on Hate is at right now. That used to be my little old hangout spot. And there was a club called Milk, and he was performing at Milk. And... Uh, I walked in and it was kind of like a scattered, like it was near the end of his show. It was kind of a scattered crowd. I seen him right there. I walked up. I said, what's up, Jack? I'm a fan of yours. Check out this cherry pie. That's when cherry pie first came out. And he smelled the cherry pie and he was fired up. And uh, and so he was like, man, we, we need a link. Like, I need some more of this. Like, you ain't got no more of this on you. I'm like, nah. So, you know, we linked up. We ended up doing a song and then it turned into like a project, which turned into a series called The Drought Season. So, you know. Yeah, man, Jack was a humble-ass dude. He was just chilling in there. And that weed was, you know, the intro. It's, it seems to always be the intro, that weed. That's it brings fact. people together, you know what I mean? That's a fact. That's a fact. It definitely does. See, you're a, li you're a living legend in this shit, you know what I mean? And, I, and, and the progression the watch that you've done has been remarkable to me, brother. And I just want to tip my hat to you. But Thank you, man. Being able to really move through this shit because... You know, it's hard to invent all the time. And I feel like every rollout, every drop, even when it comes to branding, the weed is always reinvention. You always take it up another notch. How important Man, it's hard, it's hard to balance this shit out, like the music and the weed. I've been doing music since 2007, like dropping albums at least. You know, it's, it's, it definitely takes a lot of work. Right, right. How do you manage branding? How important is branding to your brand, to you? Branding is everything. Branding is everything. Like, you know, I always tell people, like, this color blue sticks out like a motherfucker because we made it ours. You know what I mean? I put that shit everywhere. And the C right here, too. You know, the C is like a, it's like a Nike sign. And this is our font. You know what I mean? So creating our identity is crucial. Um, if you got a brand, you got you got to pick those three things. You have to have an identity. You have to have like a font. You have to have a colorway. That way, when people see your shit, they associate. It. That's why when I paint them buildings blue, motherfuckers ride down the block and they see them blue LEDs in that blue building and know what it is. So creating creating identity is everything. And I realized that when I was at the dispensary early on, that a lot of people didn't have brands or identities. And I told myself that I was one of the first person to come with something that sticks. It's gonna really stick. I knew the weed was going to be big one day. I knew it. Right, right, right. You know, you know your butt is official and your brand is official when you get two legs, right? How do you feel about all the bootleg? Because I feel like, you know, that shit, it turn, it's a business. You understand? I like bootleggers. I like bootleggers. Yeah, I wanted to know. I wanted to get your perspective. Yeah. So, look, for the people in the game, you know, a lot of a lot of my homies that are creating brands right now, they get so mad when they see fake bags on the street, right? And like, man, that's some, I said, listen, that's your cheerleader right there because it does two things. One, it puts your brand on the street. It lets people know that's what's in demand, right? They set that standard for you. And two, motherfucker get that shit and smell and be like, I know this can't be it. I got to get the real. And so it constantly keeps them searching for the real until they pull up to the store they ain't, they ain't finna know what's real and what's not. So, you know, at first I used to be hot. I used to try to, you know, call people out on everything. And I just realized that was a waste of energy. And, and that if you just understand and, and accept that they are cheerleaders for your brand and motherfuckers will find the real when they want to find the real. Because if you buy a Gucci bag on the street off somebody, you might get a good price. But when you get home and you find out it's fake, you can't really be mad at yourself. Right. 
you 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 still like you bought it knowing right and so i look at it, like people are when they want to find the real they find the real you know? right because for me like i find myself arguing with certain people once i get certain things because i know i know better and i know what it is and you know they'll try to push it on you like it's really Man, what people be using my name crazy like Cats will call me from the south, like, yo, but my folks, he said he just copped a 30 pack from you, bro. Woo, woo. And I'll be like, put me on speaker. And I'm like, what's up? He'll be like, oh, bro, what's up? I need your number. I'm like, see, he ain't copped nothing from me. You know what I mean? So it's like, people will be lying. But they'll be doing anything to sell packs. It's pretty pretty funny, man. But at the end of the day, man, you can't knock the house. Right, right. Can't I mean, knock it. Yeah, you can't. I mean, we got our own breakfast club. You know what I mean? So. We all kind of, we all get it internally, but you know, it's just, it's good for the people to hear it. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. you know, going back inside or like, how put me on to a lot of, a lot of new buzz, like Girl Scout cookies. I remember we was in Alchemist crib, me, you. Ooh, that batch right there was special. I never smoked no Girl Scout like that ever in my life. That because shit look. That's when we were first, like, flowering out that, like, there was different phenos of that shit coming. And that was one of them ones. I remember giving it to Alchemist. It was in an orange push, like, a jar, like the uh, orange pop-top jars. Yes. Man, that batch was crazy. That was in the early 2000s. That shit was crazy. Yeah, that, that was different. How that was different. Because I feel like, you know, it's, it's always new weed, but you always know what, 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 what it is, like, what's next. How do you go about picking the strains that's next? Man, people bring me, like, you know, a bunch of different varieties. So breeders that bring me, like, 20 to 40 different, you know, jars of the same strain and um, just different phenols. And I'll go through it, and I just look for three things, you know, taste, high, you know, and bag appeal. And when I go for taste, I look for smell and taste, high, and bag appeal. And if it meets those three things, then you got some. You know what I mean? And sometimes... Like the grenadine, that's one of the ones I picked recently to, to go in rotation. It's a very finicky plant. It doesn't have the best bag appeal, but that smell and, and that taste is just very similar to like what cherry pie used to do for people back in the days. It's just you smell that shit and you're like, God damn, what the fuck is that? And so, you know, it's just as a connoisseur that's been smoking for a long time and I'm in love with weed, man, like, it's my thing, you know. So I've seen some of the best and I just embrace talent around me too, you know. Cool. You look at you go in a cookie store. You don't just see cookies, weed. You know what I mean. You see our shit, and then you see other menus. And if you look at the brand cookies, we constantly take um, other people that are, are breeding and, and talented in the game, and put them under our wing, and put them in position. So, you know, kind of look at like look at Jeezy and look at and Gucci Man. No disrespect to either of them. Gucci's hella relevant right now. Fuck with all the young artists getting. He's endorsing them, embracing them. You know, boom. He's still like right here. And Jeezy kind of took his route and stayed true to himself. But at the same time, he didn't really grab up all that talent. So that's the way I look at it when it comes to the weed. I try to like the music. Like the ones that embrace that new young talent and keep around all that, they're, they're going to be in the mix for a long time. And they'll get props for putting people in position. I like putting people in position. You know what I mean? Like the brands we have, we took them from the black market and put them on the white market. Because at the end of the day, a lot of people question my intention and the shit. My intention is when I pass... I want to be able to put as much fire in, in, in the ecosystem as possible. I don't want my kids, 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 friends growing up smoking trash. If it's going to be legal, you got to stay true to what we grew up doing. And that's seeing that fire and that new shit. I don't want people just smoking one kind that comes in a fucking cigarette pack and having three. That's, we can't do that. We need to have fire out there because all the real weed smokers in the future deserve to see what we've seen, right? Right. Menus, menus. So that's what I care about. Right. See, because you have the Midas touch. You know, when you say something, is, is it? Everybody goes toward that. You know what I mean? So, you know, for people out there that's that's looking and, and asking how that works, you just got a little bit of the psyche. You know how else it works, too? You let your bag talk. So if I say something's it and someone gets it and it's trash, how good is my word, right? Mm -hmm. But if I tell someone something's it and they get it and they're like, God damn. They're like, yo, homie's like a little Cisco Weaver. He knows his movies. He knows his weed. You know what I mean? And so, right. with that being said, there's a lot of new shit coming, man. We got shit. I got shit coming, bro. A lot of oh, shit. Can't wait to get that way to, to, to get my preview and see what's going on. 
I've like, been I've been on this heavy too lately, man. This is a G Pen uh the G Pen Dash for the flower. It's like a little flower vape. I've been fucking with it, man. It's not a jewel. I just wanna let people know it's not a jewel if they see me in the cut hitting this. Yeah, if I see you fucking with a vape, it gotta be good because Yeah, nah, this this herby in here. This herby in here for sure. Right, 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 right. See, you got three tiers to your shit. You know what I mean? You got the weed, you give people the soundtrack to smoke the weed to, right? And then you have the merchandise that you can wear this hoodie and this t-shirt or this hat while you're smoking this weed too. How did you think of coming with that tri branding? Because I feel like everything is in sync. How how do you go about that? Like how do you go about mixing the merch with the weed that coincides with the music? You know, the music was always just a hobby, and the hobby ended up being kind of a platform, a commercial for what I want to preach about. And when I first did the clothing, I had a video shoot with Big Crit, Chris Brown, and Wiz off a record I bought from Crit and Shipes back in the days, Yoko, right? And so I told myself, this is probably the biggest look I'm going to have, and if I'm going to do a video, I want to wear something I own. I don't want to wear, like, a polo. I don't want to – what's that going to do for me? This is going to have millions of views. So I made myself a cookie sweatshirt because that's what I was on. And, and if people go take a look back in, uh, before cookies and video I had with like Sean Paul from the Young Bloods and Quinn, I was wearing a Cherry Kush shirt. So I was on, before all that, I was on branding my shit. Like I was proud of my weed. I was like, I'm finna rep this shit, right? And um, so I put the cookie sweater on the Yoko video and that shit just popped. It had that blue and that was my colorway. I picked my colorway because I seen Diamond had their colorway. I seen... You know, Pink Dolphin had their colorway. I said, I need my identity, right? And I picked this cookie blue. So I had that blue with the blue strings. I remember buying the fat lace uh, shoe strings on Hay Street and pulling them through the sweater myself. Because when I made, made the blue with the black strings, I'm like, ah, it looks kind of cheap. And now I, I seen some strings. I took the strings I put next to my blue. I'm like, damn, the motherfuckers match perfectly. Mm -hmm. I'm like, cool. So I pulled the fat laces through. And that blue on that blue in that video pop. And so, you know, I just realized that at the end of the day, like, when you want to come out with the brand, you got to stamp that shit. You got to live that shit. I see a lot of people now, even some of the underground breeders and growers and whatnot, having their own merch and shit. Even people that hate on me, I see them. I'm like, I know they picked up some game from what we did because ultimately, the more you put this shit in people's face, the more they're going to understand that shit when they see it. When something's tangible and they can act, maybe people can't buy a cookie to weed, they can't get it, but then they see the shirt, they, see, they feel like they're a part of that shit. So... You know, just got to stamp that shit, wear that shit, be about that shit, put that shit everywhere. And I see people really doing it now. I feel like Cookies was one of the first brands in the industry. Straight up. Nah, I mean, bro, I'm not going to hold you. You inspired, you inspired us a lot. Uh, speaking for myself, um, it's when it comes to merchandise and even the collabs, which I want to get because I feel like, you know, at some point the last maybe three years, I feel like you found a, a, a nook and, and a little, not even a little, but a niche into doing collab projects and, and driving those towards streams and doing projects and doing merch and having a strain to come with it. You feel me? And I, when I seen you do it, I was like, this is fucking figured it out. You know, you got collab, a collab album with Spill. You got one. Well, you have, I think, what do you want to think? installment with be real me and be real got four albums together so four see look yeah we're, we're working on the fifth, fifth we're on right. five you got one with yeah. killer I, I believe you got one with dolph like you know you are you, you're constantly moving the only thing you ain't me and me and you ain't doing one yet and we got to do that we need to smoke this that's coming you already know that's coming culture you know yeah but what is your dream collab because i feel like you've worked with almost everyone who haven't you worked with yet that you're looking forward to working Shit. with man there's been so many collabs i mean and that's the way i kind of started out doing it too you know i always thought about like when i first started rapping the first like two or three albums i did was a collab was i was like i'm a nobody right now right and so i figured if i get solid packaging and i kind of pick solid production and I, and I put out a project that shines hard from the packaging to the sounds and the mixing to the mastering and everything. Whether, and I was learning how to rap in my first album. I'm still learning how to rap. But 
I felt like them collab was tapping into different fan bases because when people seen that Burning Jack album, that cover was so hard. The beats were so hard. It was mixed and mastered dope. We had dope features on it. So, you know, that's the way I kind of built my my music brand was just tapping in with hella people. And then I would drop a solo and then I'd drop a couple group albums and a solo and build it up like that. But I think the, I think the Dream collab, man, it'd probably be a production play. It'd probably be Dr. Dre, Chronic 2020. Really? Mm, you fucked me up with that because I was looking for an artist. You hit me with a producer. Yeah, yeah, I've done a lot. Of, I've done a lot of artist collabs, man. 2020 so, with you, that's that's hard. You know, shit, man. Like that's the way I'm feeling right now is because I sat down with Dre and some other shit, and we didn't really discuss music, but I wanted to tell him, man, let's go ahead and run that Chronic 2020, you know, and just and just have him oversee that and, and go big with it, but. Probably be chronic two thousand and twenty five or something. I got a lot more work to do, man. So right. I'm, I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep grinding. But I felt like that would be dope because the merch I could roll out around that and the strain I could roll out around that and the sound I could roll out around that would be timeless. I got that's the one thing about the burn, I got a good ear, man. People may not like the rap, but the ear is, is golden. All right, good ear. The the shit I got Scott Stores doing for me, B real shit, man, it's a wave. So, how was you it know, Storch? Man, Scott Storch is a legend. Legend. You know, even during right now, the pandemic and shit, just sending him an idea, saying, yo, I want to flip a record like this, but without flipping it. And he calls me 20 minutes later on the keys with the same vibe, anything. He's the man. That's why the Big Piscato album was so dope doing it with him, because I told him it's like it's like being a kid wishing I could work with Scott Storch and finally being able to work with Scott Storch. It's the truth. It's what I used to want to do. Hmm. Challenge to do. Human human sample. Human sample, yeah. I am sure it's surreal. And speaking of surreal, you know, you've you've worked with a lot of people. With a lot of people. Who is you the said you broke up for a second, brother? Oh yes, people keep calling me my fault. I said you've worked with a lot of people and you've smoked with a lot of people. Who's the mm -hmm. illest person that you've smoked with thus far? I'm gonna fuck people up with this one because I'm not the guy to name drop and and, and say someone because they're popular or something like that. I'm gonna keep it one thousand. Yuck mouth. Uh, from the West Coast, Yuck Mouth you. from the Loonies. Yuck Mouth smokes big, back to back, nonstop. Mr. I Got Five on it. Shout out to Yuck Mouth. Man, I Got Five on it. Yuck Mouth blows big, big. And look, Wiz smokes a lot, and Be Real smokes a lot. But Yuck Mouth, when I, when I linked up with him, that boy was back to back blunt, just nonstop, just the whole time we're together. And he was hitting Patron like water. I'm like, man, this guy's an animal. He, he's the best. <laughs> Big smoke. Big smoke. Yuck mouth blowing. Huge. That's crazy. I think two people that fucked me up smoking with them, one person was Steven Adler just because it was Steven Adler. Shout out to Steve mm -hmm. Lobel. That was that was Steve Lobel having me with Steve Nadler for Guns N' Roses. Uh, Steve Lobel is a good person to get high with too, by the way. <laughs> yeah, he he is a fucking movie without the weed. If you can convince him to smoke, he's incredible. Yeah, <laughs> and and fucking you know cliche, but but the dog, you know, the first time oh, I sure, smoked yeah. with the dog, and I smoked one of his blunts. And I felt like it was the first time I smoked weed before me because I was smoking with the dog. And that shit just had me just geeking inside, like for me to go back home and tell my story. But, Man, you wanna hear a funny you wanna hear a funny story about Snoop real quick? Yeah, let me hear a funny story about Snoop. Man, Snoop stole some weed from me one time. I didn't know how to feel about it, man. You said what? He stole some weed from me one time. I didn't know how to feel about it. He did it so <laughs> cold, man. I gotta tell the story because I ain't never told it. I'm high. Uh I went over there, it's when the lemonade first came out. Right? <laughs> I was like, yo, smell this, homie. He smelled and said, ooh, Chateau Limon. I said, yeah, that's that shit, right? And he took the jar and he put it down by his feet. I'm like, fuck. I'm like, 
And that's all I had. I brought this to LA to show this off to everybody. You know how I get down. Only if I have a little bit, I'm going to make that bitch stretch. I'll give you a gram. I'm going to leave you with a gram and keep it pushing. Right. So I said, dog, let me see that jar. I'm about to roll one up for us. He's like, oh, I'm going to roll one, nephew. I'm good. And he rolled one. And he lit it up. And he was like, boom. Picked up his jewelry. Picked up the jar and stepped out the room. I'm like, oh, shit. And security came in. His homie came in. and was like, hey, dog, finna take a nap. Oh, uh, he going to tap in with you later. I'm like, damn, I just got got, I just got got by Snoop Dogg, and I didn't know how to, I felt like in the movie How High, when you kept hitting it, <clears throat> it was like the biggest compliment, and like, stick, like, I didn't know what to do, but it was tight, I got, Snoop got me for that, for the uh, Lemonade, when it That's first came out. I ain't gonna lie, bro, you be having a pack, bro, it happens, man, it, 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 yeah. It, and you, you know, every time I come over there, I leave with a popcorn bag. Shout out to you. Shout out to Kenny Powers. Y'all love me. Yeah. Sent me back on my way. Very nice. Now, I mean, you, how, how was it smoking with Rose, with Rick Ross? Oh, you, man. Classic. Bro, it's a movie. And smoking with him is a movie. It's, it's within the movie. <laughs> man, look, he was so happy when he hit that Gary Payton. He was fucking with it. And we just started chopping game, man. Like, shout out to Rose, man. He's a real boss. Like, that's his business is on point. What I always loved about Rose is whenever anyone in his camp drops something, the whole camp is pushing it. He's putting as his profile picture. Everyone's putting as their profile picture. They move mean as a unit, so I respect that. You know what I mean? Like, I really respect the way that he moves with his, with his unit. But getting high with him is a movie, man, for sure. It's a movie. The first time I smoked with him was on a set of the video that we shot. And, you know, that was another moment that I was just, like, geeking. And, he, you know, we was chopping a lot of game, but it was very theatrical. You know what I mean? Yes. There was a yes. lot of theatrics that can't. It was like talking to Don Corleone. You know what I mean? Man. And giving me the... Rose, Rose is a boss. Yeah, he he's boss, a boss. He talks that boss talk. That's a fact. That's a fact. Shout out to Kid from Kid and Play on here right now I see him on the chat but you know before hey, I kid, we got smoke on a kid what's up what up kid i got a nice bag for you man dm me man i got you brother oh yeah that that's he need that house the house party weed man need need my that dad used to say you want to watch house party and drink a 40 when i was young when i was like in like fifth to sixth grade let me drink a beer and watch that with him my pops was a savage that's one of my favorite movies of all time yeah. house party one party three yeah Two, Class. two good flicks. It was good too, but I love the house party um, movies. But you know, before I let you go, bro, what is some advice that you can give an aspiring artist, um, CEO, A and R, producer that's coming up in this culture that we're in and elevating their game? What what's the gem that you believe them with? Yeah, so three things, and and some of them may sound cheesy, but they really work. You know what I mean? So you could take the advice if you want to, but. First thing is never give up. I've been hated on by so many people, bro. I've had album covers, Photoshop. Before there was a MySpace or an Instagram. I've been played so many times. I've never given up, and I got myself into a great position with the music, which was a hard thing to do for me because music game is tough. So never give up. You got to keep pushing. No matter what anyone says, you got to keep pushing. The second thing is I definitely recommend when you invest in yourself, it's a whole other ball game. When you invest in yourself, you cannot fail. You may not get done what you want to get done right away, but when you put your own money behind yourself, you're going to work a little differently. If I go to someone else and I haven't put up money behind me, I may not take it that serious. But if I take my last money, and that Yoko video was my last money, straight up, like what I paid Chris Brown and what I paid for the video was my last money. When you take your last money, you're going to push a little different, bro. So invest in yourself. And the third thing would be you got to shoot your shot, but you got to do it a certain way. So if I'm around Dr. Dre and the vibe ain't right, don't oversell yourself. Don't shoot your shot then. Just keep conversation up. I didn't talk to Dre about music at all. I wanted to. But it's about knowing when to bring up some and also taking advantage of when, you, when you're around someone, how to pitch yourself as what you're going to do. You don't want everyone to oversell yourself. People don't like people that are just overselling themselves, right? What's up? I do music. I need a beat. Like, listen. Yeah, but like, who the fuck is this dude? <laughs> fuck out of here, right? It's all about showing that you're cool, not asking, you know, Let, let's get this or let's do this or let's do Just keeping it cool and leaving on a player note and keeping conversation. But when the time is right, shoot your shot. You got to shoot your shot. 
You got to know when the time is right. And that's a very, like, I've been around people where I wish to God I would have took a picture with them. But I know that it's going to happen again. And when it happens, they're going to be like, yeah, dude's cool. He's mellow. He wasn't thirsty. He wasn't on one. He, he was really respectable when he carried himself properly. You want to be, you want to be, be able to shoot your shot in the right way. That's, that's the most important thing I can tell anyone. You know what I mean? Because first impression mm -hmm. is everything. You know what it's like. Someone, Abby. someone, what's up? I do music. Let me do it. Nah, man, that dude is. But someone comes up, what's up, bro? Hey, here's a little something for you. I fuck with you. I'm going to run to you again when I do. You're going to, you're going to, okay, cool. And then you see that person again, you're going to really listen to their shit. Straight up. That's oh. a lot of people, a lot of people reel me in like that. So you only speaking truth right now. That's real. Facts. Facts. That's the walking fucking gem. My man, brother. look. Send me the address. I'm gonna send you one of these right here. This this thing right here is good for New York, man. For real. You want to be low key? Oh, I, walk I, around, I, blaze. Need I one need of these that. right. Here. I'm definitely gonna press. You know we got we got even more stuff to talk about because we got some music to do, and and yeah. I, I we got some cool announcements in the next few weeks. People won't they, they'll be surprised, but they won't be surprised because it's been smoking stuff for a long time, man. You know what I mean? Original well, club, man. Yeah, that's the a, Nipsey Hustle Tour, baby. Yeah. That's original Smokers Club. That's a yeah. fun fact. That's a fun yeah. fact. My brother, sure. thank you so much for coming. Thank you, brother. And, and sharing insight and speaking on your journey, bro. And like I said, I tip my hat to you. You're one of the inspirations out here, one of the fucking fathers of this culture that's pushing this shit forward. And salute to you, bro. Salute, brother. You pick three, I'll pick three. Send them over to me, man. Let's get this cracking, man. Come on. Done. Done. I'm going to shoot it. Come on, have Cosmo do our three. My All three, right. and then you pick three. Third, third going to do our three, so that's it. We get that shit Come on. Right there. Salute, brother. My brother. All right, bro. Peace. You already know. My brother burning this motherfucker. Cookie Smokers Club shit. You know what I mean? Perp Invaders. Jetpack. We out here. Cozy cans, but yo, <clears throat> you know what I mean. I hope y'all enjoyed that independent thinking. Um, tomorrow I'm back with some more cool people. We gonna keep this uh this TED talk for hustlers going. Really fucking cool. <laughs>